All right, thank you, brother. Okay, so keep your Bibles open there in Galatians 4. And the unthinkable has happened to this church, right? As we're reading that about uh, the Galatians, hey, this is a true church of Christ, of course. These people were saved. But if you were following along with the, the chapter there, certain people had crept in unawares into that church and had brought them back into bondage. They were messing up the gospel. You know, they were bringing them back into the bondage of the old covenant. The things that were meant to picture Christ, the things that were meant to represent Christ and point you to Christ, they'll say, no, you've got to go back to those things. You've got to go back to those weak uh, elements, right? You've got to go uh, back to the Sabbath days and, and keeping the laws and all those things. And it was messing up the church. Now, why did this happen? Well, look at verse number 16. Galatians 4, 16, it says, Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? So Paul's trying to clean up house here. He says, look, I'm telling you the truth. You've got a problem. You've got to fix this up. But what happened? Look at verse number 17. They, they're speaking about the false prophets, speaking about people coming in, creeping in. He says, they zealously affect you, but not well. Okay? So this church had allowed certain people to creep in. Hey, they were full of zeal. They were full of excitement. They looked like they were great people, but they had caused this church to get into a really bad place, mixing up the gospel with works or with the commandments. And then it says this, Yea, they would exclude you, that ye might affect them. So once they creep in, once they give in some influence in the church, and they exclude those that actually know the gospel well. Okay, look at verse number 18. But it is good to be zealously affected always in a good thing, and not only when I am present with you. So Paul is saying, look, it's good to be zealous, but instead of you being influenced, instead of you, your zeal, pouring out on the church, you've allowed the wicked to come in. You've allowed those that have a false gospel to come in and zealously affect you. Okay? So what do we learn in that passage? That zeal is good. You know, we ought to be people that have zeal. Paul says, look, have some zeal, not just when I come and visit you. You should be a church that's zealous for the things of God. Because if you're not zealous for the things of God, you're going to allow someone else to come in who's zealous and they're going to bring in their false doctrines. They're going, to, you know, they're going to influence the church in a negative way. Why am I talking about this? Because in Isaiah 59 verse 17, it says, speaking of God, for he put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation upon his head, and he put on the garments of vengeance for clothing and was clad with zeal as a cloak. All right, so we're up to the final sermon on the armor of God. And when we saw, you know, we've gone through Ephesians 6, but there were two more parts that are in the armor that we read about in Isaiah 59. Number one was the garments of vengeance. And you've seen that already. And that's a piece of clothing that only God can wear. Vengeance belongs to God. But then we see this other piece that he was clad with zeal as a cloak. So not only does God have the armor on, he's got a cloak on. He's got like a cape on as well, okay? And that cloak represents zeal, okay? It represents zeal. So the title for the sermon tonight is Clad with Zeal. Clad with Zeal. Now, the, the uh, dictionary definition of zeal is great energy or enthusiasm in pursuit of a cause or an objective. Now, brethren, we have a cause, amen? We have an objective, the Great Commission. Well, then how should we act toward it? We should have zeal. We should have great energy or enthusiasm in pursuit of this cause, in pursuit of this objective. Now, what's going to happen naturally as you live out the Christian life? You're going to have times when you are full of zeal and you're excited and you're just, you know, just desiring to serve God with all your might. And there'll be other times that the zeal will be gone. Like you're just gonna, not going to have that zeal and you're hoping there'll be someone else in the church that will you know, influence you in a positive way, that will provoke you onto love and good works. And you know, we need to understand, you know, it, it's not always easy to be full of zeal all the time. It's not like I wake up in the morning, I can't wait to read my Bible. I'm going to read my Bible for two hours and then I'm done. I'm going to go soul winning for five hours. And then I'm going to come, I'm going to prepare the sermon, I'm going to come to church Wednesday night and preach a powerful sermon. And then I'm going to go to sleep and I pray and I'll read another hour of the Bible. And I'm going to wake up Thursday morning and I'm just going to do it all over again. I, I wish I could do that, brethren. <laughs> but listen, if, if, that's, if that's the Christian life, just full of zeal, constantly, you're going to burn out. All right, so we need to manage the zeal. Now, please go to 2 Samuel chapter 21. Let's have a look at a story here. 2 Samuel 21, we're going to Old Testament Israel when David was the king over Israel. Of course, who was the king before David? It was King Saul. 
all right? And the problem is King Saul had done something wicked in, during his time, and it was having an effect during David's time, okay? And so David goes to the Lord to inquire, why is this going on? And look at verse uh, number 1, 2 Samuel 21, 2 Samuel 21, verse 1. Just give you a moment to turn there. 2 Samuel 21 and verse number 1, it says, Then there was a famine in the days of David three years. Okay, so the Lord sends a famine during the time of King David for three years. And then look at this. Year after year, and David inquired of the Lord. It says, Lord, what's going on? Right? And the Lord answered, It is for Saul and for his bloody house because he slew the Gibeonites. Now, this is interesting about the Lord. The Lord, our God, is a God of justice, okay? But He's also long-suffering, you know? And, and sometimes He just waits and waits and waits, and then eventually, sometime down the track, you know, His judgment falls. And His judgment for this wicked act by Saul, where He had slain the Gibeonites, uh, was, was uh, you know, the consequence of that was affecting David's kingdom, all right? Look at verse number two. And the king called the Gibeonites and said unto them, now the Gibeonites were not of the children of Israel, but of the remnant of the Amorites, and the children of Israel had sworn unto them, and Saul sought to slay them in his zeal to the children of Israel and Judah. So what are we looking at here? We're looking at misplaced zeal. Now listen, the Gibeonites were enemies of Israel, okay? But what do we see here? That they had, made a, they had sworn something unto them, right? The children of Israel had sworn unto them. They had made a promise to the Gibeonites. You say, what was that promise? You don't need to turn there. But back in Joshua days, right? Back in the book of Joshua, chapter 9, verse number 15, it says, And Joshua made peace with them and made a league with them to let them live and the princes of the congregation swear unto them. So the Israelites, instead of destroying the Gibeonites, they made a promise and said, look, we'll let you live, we'll let you stay on this land, and they make an agreement with them, right? Now, this was 400 years before King Saul went to slay them, all right? And so God has this memory, right? This long memory, hey, 400 years ago, you made an agreement and you broke that agreement and you went to slay those Gibeonites, okay? That was in the time of King Saul. But again, why did King Saul do it? What did it say there? At the end of verse number two, uh, two, uh, two, it says, And Saul sought to slay them in his zeal to the children of Israel and Judah. So why did he do this? Hey, he was full of zeal, but it was misplaced zeal, right? He did it to appease the people. He did it to show off to the people, to the children of Israel and of Judah. Hey, look how great of a king I am. I'm going to finish off those Gibeonites. And he steps in full of zeal, you know, probably thinking he's doing the will of God. He slays them, but the Lord remembers the promise that they made, that Israel made 400 years ago. And now King David's kingdom is suffering for that. You know, the famine for three years. And so what we learn here is that, yes, yeah, zeal is good, but it also can be very damaging, okay? If you don't put it in the right place, you don't channel your zeal in a productive or positive way, that same zeal can be very destructive, all right? Now, this is important because you can see that King Saul sought to please the people, okay? And he's the king. And you know what? If you uh, are a pastor, you're going to become a pastor one day or you take on a position of leadership, you know, I, even me as a pastor, I do want to please you guys. Like, I want to make you guys happy. I want you to be happy with me as a pastor, but I can't revolve my ministry around that. You know, I've got to be zealous for the Lord. I've got to make sure He's happy, and I hope... By doing that, you guys can also be pleased by, you know, in that process. But you can see that King Saul compromised, wanted to please the people rather than please the Lord, and, he, and his, his zeal was misplaced. He had done extreme wickedness. So this is a warning to pastors or anyone that takes on a position of leadership. You need to remember your zeal needs to be toward God, you know, not in a destructive way. Please the Lord, and if people like it or don't like it, it doesn't matter. You're doing it to serve the Lord, right? That's why we come to church. I don't come to church for my, to make you enjoy me or, you know, to be, to be positive-minded toward me necessarily, we come here to worship God. And we, the only way we can worship God is in spirit and in truth. And so we have to do things correctly. That's how the Lord receives worship, okay? You know, what, else, what other stories do we have in the Bible of misplaced zeal? Well, when Paul the Apostle speaks of himself, remember, before he became an apostle, before he met Jesus Christ, he was persecuting the church, all right? Remember that? 
And Paul says about himself in Philippians 3, 6, concerning zeal. He says, look, I had zeal before I got saved. Concerning zeal, then he says this, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. And then he says this, but what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Listen, and the unsaved out there, they have zeal. All right? They have zeal for their religion. They have zeal for the things they believe, right? And, you know, this is, when you go door to door soul winning, sometimes you see that, right? The, the hardest person, I believe, to get saved when you go door to door soul winning is the guy that's zealous for their faith, that's zealous for their religion, that's zealous, well, I know I'm saved because I can speak in tongues. I'm so sure about it. They have zeal for it, but it's a misplaced zeal. And they have to come to the point like Paul and says, but what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Okay, sometimes it's hard to let go of the things that you've been zealous about. And you know, that's just life. There are going to be times in your life that you're zealous about something, then you kind of lose interest. I'm not talking about spiritual things. I'm just talking about any, maybe hobbies, you know, things that you're, you, you might be studying or, or reading about. There are times that you just really have a zeal to learn, and then other times you just, oh, I've kind of lost interest in that, right? I mean, as, as you mature and grow, grow, grow just as, you know, from a child to an adult, there are things that my children are very zealous about. But I know when they become adults, they're going to be like, why do we waste so much time, you know, playing with those things or, or, you know, making up those stories or whatever it is that they do, right? Because, you know, we need to make sure that our zeal is just put in the right place. And then when it comes to Old Testament Israel, or, or not really Old Testament Israel, but when it comes to Israel, you know, of the Jewish faith, those that rejected Christ, in Romans chapter 10, verse number 1, Paul says about them, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved, for I bear them record that they have a zeal of God. They have a zeal of God. Wow, that's good. No, then it says this, but not according to knowledge. They've got a zeal. Hey, it's an emotional thing. It's a traditional thing, but it's not something according to knowledge. How can we be sure that our zeal is right? Well, it's got to be according to knowledge. And you know, this is the knowledge, okay? This is the book of knowledge that we need to make sure when we're zealous for something, it lines up with what we see in the Word of God. That's how we know. And then he says about these unsaved Jews, he says, For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Hey, who else is very hard to get saved? Those that are trying to uh, establish their own righteousness. I know I'm going to heaven because I'm a good person. I've not done anything horrible. You know, I'm true to myself, whatever that means. Right? I treat others like I would like to be treated. You know, they're very hard to get saved because they're full of righteousness. They can't see their sin. They don't realize that God sees their, their, their one lie that they made. You know, the one sin they've committed is enough to make them deserving of hell. And so there is misplaced zeal, okay? And we had a look at, you know, obviously Saul, he was a saved man. But we also looked at, you know, Paul before he was saved and the Jews that are not saved here. And look, saved people can have misplaced zeal and obviously the unsaved people have misplaced zeal, all right? So I want us to be careful. I want you guys to be zealous. I want you to be enthusiastic for everything that we do in this church, how you serve the Lord. But I want to make sure that your zeal is in the right place. Now let's have a look at some places that our, our zeal should be at, okay? You guys go to John chapter 2. Go to John chapter 2, verse 15. John chapter 2, verse 15. And I'm going to read to you a portion in Psalm 69, verse 9, which reads, For the zeal, there it is, the zeal, of thine house have eaten me up, and the reproaches of them that reproach thee are fallen upon me. Some of you guys might know what that reference is about, okay? But there's a zeal for thine house. And of course, the house is the temple, the Old Testament temple. But when it comes to the New Testament, it's the local church, okay? So we should be zealous for church. We should be enthusiastic about church. I can't wait Wednesday night. Yeah, I had a hard day of work. I could, I could stay home and listen into the live streaming maybe. But I'm going to be there in the house of God with the brethren. I'm going to worship God. I'm going to sing praises to Him. Hey, that's, that's, that's having a zeal, you know? It's just knowing that you guys are here tonight shows me that you have a zeal for God. You have a zeal for His church. Now, where does this passage come up? It comes up in John chapter 2, verse number 15. Very famous story that we all love to read about. It says here, And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changes' money and overthrew the tables. 
And he said unto them that sold doves, Take these things from hence, make not my father's house and house of merchandise. Verse number 17. And his disciples remembered that it was written, The zeal of my, thine house have eaten me up. Hey, how zealous was Jesus for the house of God? Hey, he made a whip. He drove out those money changers. He, he drove out those that were making the house of God a house of merchandise. You know what? The house of God ought to be a place where we drive out wicked people. All right? Now, I'm not necessarily going to get a rope out <laughs> and make a whip if someone comes in and they're wicked, but we've had wicked people come and they've gone. All right? I mean, we've used the, the sword of the Word of God to drive them out, okay? But I just want to show you that the passion, the enthusiasm that Jesus Christ had for the house of God. Okay, and, and Jesus, of course, knows that a lot of those religious leaders serving in the temple were corrupt and wicked. Hey, but it's still the house of God. He had a passion for the house of God, all right? Now, the other place I want to turn to is go to Revelation chapter 3, verse 17. Revelation chapter 3, verse 17. We're still on the topic here of being zealous for the house of God, all right? So much so, we don't want this place to turn into a house of merchandise. I never want you to buy and sell in this place Please, you know, if there is an exchange that you guys need to make, we always, we're always doing things like that, right? Not in the house of God, but if there's something, do it outside, do it after the service, you know, do it in your own time even, okay? I'd rather you do it there, not in the house of God. I don't want Jesus coming in with a whip here, okay? And in Revelation chapter 3, verse number 17, now we have the church here of uh, Laodicea, and we've gone through this a few times now, but I just want you to think about this once again, because this church... They thought they were a great church. They thought they were just serving God faithfully, right? And Jesus says about them in verse number 17, Re Revelation chapter 3, verse number 17. It says, Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. You know, one, a church of Christ can get to a point where we're wretched, poor, naked, and at, we're thinking we're, we're fine, we're doing right, we're just serving God faithfully, and Jesus saying, no, you're very poor at the moment, okay? This could happen at New Life Baptist Church. These, these things are in the Bible, so we hopefully don't become like this, or if we are in a state like this, that we can wake, you know, whoa, what does the Bible say? We're like this, we need to fix this up, all right? But then look at verse number 18, he says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, so look, they weren't even laying up treasures in heaven. They weren't accessing the gold that Jesus would give them. He says, look, start laying up treasures in heaven that thou mayest be rich, that's rich in heaven, and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed. Hey, that's having a, 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 a close walk to Jesus. You know, ask him to cleanse the sins and, and being in fellowship with the Father. And then he says here, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear and anoint thy eyes with eyes solve that thou mayest see. Hey, you guys are blind. You can't even, you know, see anymore. You don't realize the position you're in. You can't understand the scriptures. You're not teaching the scriptures the way you ought to. And then he says in verse number 19, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. But look at this. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. What is this teaching us? That if we lose the zeal, if we lose the enthusiasm, we could become a church that becomes wretched, naked, poor, and blind. Okay, so we can't lose the enthusiasm. We can't lose the zeal. Have you ever been to a church that has no zeal? Oh man, I have. Right, you walk in, everyone looks dead. No one's, no one's happy, no one's got a smile. You sing the hymns like this. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Right, just, just, just dead. And then the preacher gets behind the pulpit, maybe even using a modern version. Right? Instead of the King James Bible, just spiritually dead. But I bet you if you ask them, they think they're doing great. They think they're just serving the Lord faithfully. And Jesus is saying, no, you know, you're wretched, you're, you're, you're poor, and you're blind because they've lost the enthusiasm. They've lost the zeal. Okay? So one thing we must have in this church, brethren, is a zeal for the house of God. Okay? What else can we have a zeal for? Can you please go to 1 Corinthians 14? 1 Corinthians 14. Verse 11, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 11, because part of the zeal, part of the things that gets us excited about church, you know, one of the, the, the most significant ministry of the church when we gather together, of course, is the preaching. 
okay, the preaching of God's word. All right, so we ought to be, my point is, we ought to be zealous for preaching. All right, and if you're a preacher, hey, get some zeal into you, you know, show some enthusiasm, show some passion so people can, uh, uh, can, so, you know, the listeners can say, hey, that man knows, you know, believes what he's saying. That man is sure, that's what the Bible says, and he's preaching that with zeal, okay? Look at 1 Corinthians 14, verse 11. Now, the context of this is speaking with tongues. We know that was one of the spiritual gifts, but let's just take the principle here. In verse number 11, it says, Therefore, if I know not the meaning of the voice, I shall be unto him that speaketh a barbarian, and he that speaketh shall be a barbarian unto me. So Paul is saying, look, if someone comes in speaking another language, preaching another language in the church, he's like a barbarian to me, and I'm like a barbarian to him. We can't communicate. That's the Pentecostal church. It's the barbarian church. They're all talking in some gibberish. No one understands what's going on. It's worse than a barbarian. At least a barbarian, you get a real translator, you'll eventually understand what he's saying. These guys are making it up. Or they're demon-possessed or something. All right? But then look at verse number 12. Even so ye, for as much as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, shall we be zealous for spiritual gifts? Yeah. Seek that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. Why should we be zealous for spiritual gifts? So we can edify the church. Let's keep going. Verse number 13. Wherefore, so this is the context of that, this, the edifying here. Wherefore, let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. Okay? So he's saying, look, if you have someone with another language, like they can't speak, you know, uh, you know a Greek or whatever it would have been in that time, okay? Make sure there's an interpreter. Why? Because you want to edify the church. Okay? The preaching of God's word is a spiritual gift and it's for the edifying of the people of God. Okay? And so what I'm trying to say to you, brethren, is that you ought to be zealous for preaching. Yes, to sit down and listen to the preaching of God's word, but for the preacher himself to say, hey, I want to edify this church. I come behind the pulpit to preach, to edify them, not to edify myself, not to lift myself up, but to give the church you know, uh, some spiritual food to help them grow, to help them mature. And that ought to be an attribute of you as a preacher and listen, you know, we, we all need experience. We all need the opportunity to get behind the pulpit, study, and do it. But I want you as preachers, as you have more opportunities to preach behind the pulpit, I want you to work on your zeal. I want you to say, God, give me some of that zeal. Give me some of that passion. Give me, give me you know, and, and it can be uncomfortable, especially if you're not, you know, someone that's necessarily charismatic. I'm not talking about the charismatic church, but, you know, you know, maybe, you know, you're a little bit more reserved, maybe a little bit more quiet, but you need to understand that being zealous for these spiritual gifts is important, okay? It really helps the listener absorb the Word of God, you know? Now, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse number 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse number 10. The next point I have here, brethren, is that we ought to be zealous for overcoming sin. Zealous to overcome sin, Okay? Not to get to a point where, oh, I'm a sinner, I'm not going to, whatever, I'm going to sin tomorrow, I'm going to sin the next day. Hey, we need to be say, hey, God, give me the power, give me the strength, I really want to defeat this God. Listen, if you're full of zeal to overcome sin, don't you think God's going to help you a little bit more? If you're like, oh, I don't know, I can't enjoy this sin actually. <laughs> God's not going to give you that strength, right, to overcome those things. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10. The context of this is the man that was kicked out of the church in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And then uh, he's been, you know, the church uh, had, done inc had done wrong. They had allowed him to continue in the church. And Paul had to say, hey, you've got to kick this guy to church. All right? And then, so they did. And this is what Paul is writing about here in verse number, ten, verse number 10. It says, For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. Oh man, see, you've got to repent of your sins to be saved. Bit off topic. Of course not. That's not what he's teaching. These guys are saved. The salvation here is the salvation of the church. If you did not kick that guy out, a little leaven would have leavened the whole lump. You would have destroyed yourself. Okay? This is what it's talking about. Because look at verse number 11. It says, For behold, this selfsame thing that you sorrowed after a godly sort, what carefulness it wrought in you. Yea, what clearing of yourselves, yea, what indignation, yea, what fear, yea, what vehement desire, yea, what zeal, yea, what revenge. In all things you have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. It says you kicked him out, good work. 
You've cleared yourself of the matter because you had zeal, okay? Because what else? You had a vehement desire. That's another way of saying zeal, being zealous, a vehement desire. You wanted to get right with God. You wanted to clean this up in your church and you did it and you saved the church. You guys repented of keeping this uh, wicked sinner in the church. You got rid of him and you've done well, okay? So we need to be zealous for overcoming sin. You know, getting rid of the sin and understanding there are certain sins, there are certain uh, wicked people, yes, saved wicked people that are stuck in certain sins that are not to be allowed in the church, okay? Drunkard, drunkards, covetous, uh, railers, extortioners. What's the other one? Fornicators. Fornicators. Have I gone through the list? I think that's the general list there, right there, okay? So what's that? Idolaters. Idolaters, that's right, idolaters, I missed that one. Amen. All right, now, if you can please go to Numbers 25, verse 6. Numbers 25, verse number 6. So we ought to be zealous for getting sin, not just out of our lives, but even out of our church, okay? And in Numbers 25, verse number 6, another famous story here. I love this story. There's so many great things about this story. But it's about Israel. A lot of the children of Israel got into fornication, all right? And the Lord cursed them. And in Numbers 25, verse number 6, it says, And behold, one of the children of Israel came and brought unto his brethren a Midianitish woman in the sight of Moses and in the sight of all the congregation of the children of Israel who were weeping before the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. So this guy does not care. He's committing fornication. He takes this woman, doesn't care who's seen this. He's open and proud about his sin. And verse number 7, it says, And, and when Phineas the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest, saw it, he rose up from among the congregation and took a javelin in his hand and he went after the man to, of Israel into the tent and thrust both of them through. And he gets that javelin and he stabs them both through in the middle of their whoredoms, okay? Think about that. Think about what he's just done. He's just killed these people, all right? It says, and took, sorry, uh, what am I up to, guys? Eight. Uh, I'll read verse eight. And he went after the man of Israel into the tent and thrust both of them through. The man of Israel and the woman through her belly, so the plague was stayed from the children of Israel. Okay? So God had cursed them with a plague because of their whoredoms, and Phineas steps in, takes care of it. Okay? Now, what, what do people say about him? Verse number nine. And those that died in the plague were twenty and four thousand. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Phineas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest, have turned away my wrath away from the children of Israel, while he was zealous for my sake among them, that I consume not the children of Israel in my jealousy. Wherefore say, Behold, I give unto him my covenant of peace, and he shall have it, and his seed after him, even the covenant of an everlasting priesthood, because he was zealous for his God and made an atonement for the children of Israel. So Phineas, hey, he was zealous for the Lord. He was so zealous, he said, we can't have this sin in our congregation. He takes the javelin and he murders that man and woman. And the Lord's wrath was appeased. The Lord lifted the plague. He, not, you know, he did not allow any more to die. And he received the special covenant, you know, his, his, uh, of the lineage of the priests, obviously, in the Old Testament days there. But I want you to notice that, you know, that he loved the Lord so much. He hated sin, you know, and he, he steps in. He says, look, I'm, I'm, I'm going to just, I'm going to be zealous for the right things. All right, I'm going to serve the Lord, do something quite horrific, you know, taking a javelin, killing two people in one thrust. And yet, you see why he did it, because he had a great zeal, all right? So, as a church, you know, talking about overcoming sin, yes, in our lives, but I'm thinking about our church. You know, if someone comes in that's wicked, who's got wicked sins, listen, brethren, we need to take that javelin, spiritually speaking, and cast them out, okay? And we do it. Why do we do it? Because we have zeal, because we want to please the Lord. And if we don't carry out church discipline, when the need, you know, if, if the need is there, then expect a plague. Expect something to happen to the church, where we're being negatively affected because of whatever, because we're trying to please men once again. You know, our zeal being misplaced. Now, zeal, when you talk about the topic of zeal, though, I've come across a lot of zealous people. And, you know, in my spiritual life, there's been times that I've been very zealous. 
Other times that zeal has dropped off a little bit and, you know, it comes back and kind of goes. And uh, sometimes I'm, I'm more zealous than other days. Sometimes I get up to church to preach. And I'm a little bit more zealous than other days, things like that. But one thing I learned that for you to be a stable Christian, for you to see out, you know, uh, you know, many years of Christian life, for you to be faithful to the end, you need to temper your zeal with patience. Okay? You need to temper your zeal with patience. Now, the reason for this, brethren, is because, like, as I said, it's not realistic just to wake up in the morning and just be on fire for God to the day, you know, to, to the day, to the night, you know, to, to put your head down on the pillow and just continue that day after day after day. It's not doable. You're going to burn out, okay? Just being on fire all the time, nonstop. You're going to burn out. And it's sad because I've seen people who've been zealous for God and, you know, just you think this person's going to serve God. This person may even become a pastor one day, be a missionary, do, do great things for God, and then they're not even in church. It's like they, they just forgot all about God. They've lost the zeal. They had the zeal. What happened? You know, we've had people come through this church who are full of zeal. And where are they now, some of those people? Not even in church, not serving God. They've lost the zeal, okay? Now, please go. I'll tell you to turn to, let's see. Go to Romans chapter 12. Go to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. And while you're turning to Romans chapter 12, I'm going to read to you from James chapter 1 verse 3. James chapter 1 verse 3 reads, Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. Okay. Patience is an important attribute that you must have in your Christian life. It's important, okay? Then in verse number 4 it says, But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. What does patience give you? It gives you satisfaction. It gives you contentment. It makes you say, yes, I'm, I'm happy with what I've got. I'm happy with what God's given me. I, I'm, I'm serving the Lord. I'm content with what I've been able to achieve. That's what patience gives you. Now, zeal is the enthusiasm to do things for the Lord, right? Some people can be so zealous, so enthusiastic, and no patience, right? And, and, and they turn the marathon, the race day, the race to serve the Lord is a marathon. It's your whole life, and they turn it into a sprint. Okay? And yeah, you know, someone that starts to sprint, they're going to run faster. They're going to accomplish more. At the very beginning, they're going to do so much more than you if you're just running a marathon. But at some point, they're going to realize, boy, I've been running so hard and so fast, and they give up. Okay? And they can burn out and burn out to the point where they're out of the race completely. And the one that stays consistent is the one that took the marathon approach and says, no, look, I need to reserve my energy from time to time. Yes, there are times when I run the marathon and I can be full of zeal and I can run hard, but there are other times I need to slow down, you know, uh, reserve my energy, keep going forward. Listen, the spiritual life isn't about how fast and how hard you're running. The spiritual life is about just running forward. Just keep running. Even if it's a pace, even if it's just a walk, at least if you're going forward, you're doing something for God. And if you're going forward, sometimes you can run, sometimes you can jog, sometimes you can slow down, but it's a marathon, okay? And you need to make sure that you temper your zeal with patience. It's a marathon, it's your whole life, okay? Your whole life serving the Lord. You're in Romans chapter 12, look at verse number 11. It says, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit. Hey, that's another way of saying zeal, like being zealous. Fervent in spirit. Should we be excited? Yes. Serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope. But look, patient in tribulation. Continuing instant in prayer. Should we be fervent in spirit? Yes. Should we be zealous? Yes. But don't forget the patience. Patience in tribulation. Because if you haven't got the patience and the tribulation comes, the difficulty comes, and you've just been focused about being passionate and excited and enthusiastic and things get hard, you're going to give up because you haven't got the patience. You're going to be thinking, well, why? Why am I going for this difficulty? Hey, this isn't right. I'm just trying to serve the Lord. And you give up. No. If you had the patience, you say, well, now, hey, I'm in tribulation. I need to slow down a little bit. As long as I'm going forward for the Lord, I need to take that back a little bit. Hey, right now is not the time to be full of zeal. Right now is not the time to be on fire. I need to take, take a step back and deal with tribulation in patience. 
And then when the tribulation has been dealt with, now I can get back on board and go 100 miles per hour for a period of time for Jesus Christ. Hey, because you've got the big picture in your mind. I've got to serve the Lord to the day that I die. I want you to be zealous. I want you to be zealous for the Lord, but I want you to temper it with patience. Okay, be, be careful. I don't want you to burn out, you know, serving the Lord, you know, and becoming weary and well-doing. Now, you know, some pastors don't like it when a new person walks into their church and they're full of zeal. It's like, pastor, can you show me how to go soul winning? You know, pastor, can you teach me something? Can you show me the Bible? Can you teach me more? Some pastors don't like people with zeal. Now, look, I, I love zeal. I, I love zealous people. But I, I, I know why some pastors don't like zealous people. Because, again, if it's misplaced, they can be destructive. Okay? But I, I, I'd rather take that person with zeal. I don't want to take that zeal away. And I just want to help that person, in patience, point that zeal into a productive area. Okay? Instead of coming in and saying, hey, I know more about the Bible than you do, pastor. Hey, you taught something wrong there, pastor. I need to correct you. You know, you're brand new in the church. The pastor's been serving for who knows how many years. You know, listen, I like the zeal. I like the zeal, especially if they're right. But I'd rather take that person and say, look, you're new. You need to learn patience. You're a babe in Christ. You're just at the beginning of your spiritual walk. Let's point it in the right way. Let me help you. Let me help you understand. Let me take you soul winning. All right? Let me show you how to go soul winning. Hey, you try now. Actually, you need to slow down a little bit. There are some things that we need to fix in your life. Okay? There are some things we need to fix in your presentation. There are some things we need to fix when it comes to talking to that person at the door. Okay? Because we saw that we have to be zealous for preaching, right? And we talk about preaching in the local church. But when we go door to door soul winning, we also need to be zealous when we go knock on someone's door. You need to be enthusiastic, right? You need to show that person that you have passion to win them to the Lord. That you have passion for the message that you're trying to tell them at the door. People can pick up whether you actually believe what you're doing or you don't. You know, whether you're just doing it out of whatever. You know, you've got, got nothing else to do. You know, you're doing it out of just, just uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I don't know. Compulsion. Out of compulsion, all right? We need to be zealous, okay? And listen, being zealous is not about telling someone at the door, hey, you're going to hell if you don't listen to me. Hey, being zealous is loving that person and saying, hey, this is a soul that Jesus died for. Hey, I want to show myself friendly. I want to try to communicate to that person. I want them to know that I'm no threat to them. I'm coming with a wonderful message that I believe in. Hey, sir, how are you? You know, are you sure today that you'll be going to heaven? Or has anyone ever, anyone ever shown you from the Bible how you can be 100% sure? Hey, man, I can, take you, I can take five minutes of your time very quickly to show you what the Bible says. You know, just showing that enthusiasm will open up doors for you to give people the gospel. Okay? Enthusiasm, but we need to point it in the right way. Okay? Not zeal where they reject you. Oh, gonna, go to hell then. No, that, that's, that's zeal that's misplaced. Misplaced. Okay? Babes in Christ are like that. And we need to make sure we temper our zeal with patience. Now, when it comes to the topic of zeal, there is one passage that we need to turn to, but I'm going to get you to turn to Matthew chapter 5, actually. Go to Matthew chapter 5, and, uh, you know, the, the, the famous words of King uh, Jehu, you know, in 2 Kings chapter 10, verse 16, he says, Come with me and see my zeal for the Lord. I want you to think about that. Come with me and see my zeal for the Lord. You know, when a baby in Christ has great zeal, and they should, okay, and it's misplaced, and they're not right with God, it's, it's, it's in the wrong place, they're not going to say, come and see my zeal for the Lord. They're going to say, hey, why aren't you as zealous as me? I've seen that. I've seen people full of zeal look down at other Christians who may not have the same level of zeal as you do, or maybe they did have the same level, and because it's a marathon, they've had to slow down a little bit in life, all right? Say, well, how come you're not serving God as much as I am? How come you're not soul winning as much as I am? Hey, instead of you saying, hey, come and see my zeal. Hey, let me help you. You know, maybe, maybe some of my zeal can rub off onto you. That's how a leader should be. Maybe some of my zeal can rub off on others. You're like, hey, putting other people down because they haven't got the same level of zeal. That's a babe in Christ, okay? That's misdirected zeal. I don't want you to be that way. 
And I was talking to you about how a babe in Christ can attempt to run that sprint and just burn out. Yeah, accomplish a lot for the Lord at the beginning, but then where are they? There's so many people in my life that I can think of like that. And the saddest thing is when they come through this church and that happens to them, and they're full of zeal, and then, hey, now where are they? It's so sad, right? Because in Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, the saddest thing about being burnt out and staying burnt out is you can end up being like Matthew 5, 13, where Jesus says, Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost his savour, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. Do I want you to be zealous, brethren? Yes, I do. I want you to be enthusiastic for the work of God. But I don't want you to misplace your zeal. I don't want you to burn out. I don't want you to become salt that has lost its savour and is no more used to God. How many people do I know like this, brethren? I know too many. It's so sad. Too many people that maybe were even an encouragement toward me, that got me excited to serve the Lord, and now they've lost their savour. Now they're not serving the Lord. Maybe they're even against the works of God sometimes. Zeal can be misdirected, and we need to be careful that in our pursuit for zeal, that we are not, that we haven't misplaced it, that we've put it in the right place that God wants us to have. Now, as I said to you, this piece of armor is not in Ephesians chapter 6, just like the garments of vengeance. And I gave the reason why the garments of vengeance aren't there, because it belongs to the Lord, right? And I kind of got thinking, why is the cloak of zeal not mentioned uh, in Ephesians chapter 6? Let's have to think about a cloak, right? So if, if you're going, you know, if, if you're part of an army, you know, back, you know, like a Roman army or something back in those days, right? Um, you know, you'd have your soldiers, they'd be deck out, decked out in their armor. But do you think all of them wore a cloak? Did they all wear a cloak? No. I don't know if you've ever seen like pictures or maybe a movie of old-fashioned, you know, uh, armies and stuff like that. Sometimes, yeah, there would be certain people that would wear a cloak, you know, on top of their armor. And generally speaking, they were the leaders. They were the military leaders, right? They were the generals. And it's important for them to wear a cloak so they can be, uh, you know, in, in the... In the, in the you know, in the fog of battle, that when, when, when the military leader is trying to issue a command, trying to direct the forces, trying to give direction, people could make out, hey, that's the leader. Look at his cloak. He's got his cloak on. Here's the one that's passing direction. You know, during the time, during the time of war where things become confusing, you know, you might even be fighting your own men sometimes, things like that. Hey, when, when the leader is passing instruction, you want to hear what they have to say, and they would wear a cloak to stand out to the others, all right? So I got thinking about that. Well, maybe this is teaching us that because our Lord God, hey, the Lord God is our King of Kings. You know, he's the, he's the uh, what's the term? He's the commander in chief, all right? We're fighting the battle, the spiritual battle that God wants us to fight. He's helping us along. He's fighting with us. He's the one that's giving us direction. He's wearing the cloak. But what I got out of that, brethren, is that if you're a leader, if you're a pastor, Okay, you're a deacon, you've got a position of leadership in a church, you need to make sure you, you put that cloak on. You need to have that cloak of zeal. Because as a leader, you have an effect on others. You know, come and see my zeal for the Lord. And if you haven't got the zeal, the people won't have the zeal. And when you don't have the zeal, we're going to allow the church to fall apart. You allow wicked people to come in with false doctrines. They're going to be zealous for their false doctrines, just like we saw in Galatians chapter 4 and affect our church in a negative way. And so what I'm trying to say is that, you know, the cloak was generally reserved for military generals, so it's important for pastors and deacons to have, a, to have zeal. You know, I was, I was, as I was putting this sermon together, I was like, man, do I have the zeal? You know, I hope I'm wearing that, that, that cloak of zeal. I hope it's obvious to all that I'm the leader of this church and that I want to serve the Lord and I want to influence you guys in a positive way, okay? But deacons as well, Hey, what's a song leader? Song leader. Hey, if you come up and you be the song leader, I want you to put that cloak of zeal on. Hey, have a passion for the songs that we're singing, right? You know, get excited. Hey, we're going to sing this hymn. Let's sing it up to the Lord. Let's praise the Lord. 
have a smile on your face, show that zeal. I promise this, as a song leader, if you show yourself full of zeal, you're going to influence the others to sing it up for the Lord. Okay, we need to have that cloak of zeal. The soul winner coordinator, right now it's Brother Michael. I know Brother Michael's got a zeal for soul winning. Praise God. You know, he's the right person, in my opinion, to be coordinating the maps and things like that because I can draw from his zeal sometimes for myself to get out there. You know, why am I on day 11 of my 40-day soul winning, my own personal soul winning marathon, so I can show you my zeal for soul winning? Do I need to do it? Do I really need to do it, though? Not really. I mean, I, I should be soul winning, but of course, as a church for, was it six weeks? We went, or maybe more, we weren't able to go soul winning, right? And so I wanted to say, you know, I didn't want anybody to think, well, maybe Pastor Kevin has stopped soul winning because he really doesn't like it after all. And maybe he's actually against it. And, you know, the COVID-19 restrictions has just, you know, it's landed for him just in time. And now he's, you know, turning his back on soul winning. So for me, it was like, you know, I, need to show, you know, I don't think anybody's thinking that. But, you know, for me, it's like, well, I, I better show people a zeal for the soul winning, right? I'm trying to show you guys some photographs every day of the soul winning, trying to keep you guys updated with what's going on. Because I want you to know that I'm zealous for winning souls. I'm zealous for this church. I'm zealous for the rewards that God has in store for us in New Life Baptist Church. The cloak of zeal. We need to make sure we temper it with patience, though. You know, make sure that we're zealously serving God the way He wants us to serve Him. Have an, enth an enthusiasm, you know. I hope you guys never lose the enthusiasm for New Life Baptist Church. You know, I hope your desire, you know, it will never be, oh, we just watch the live stream tonight, or we watch the you know, live stream this Sunday, instead of actually being physically in church. That was my biggest worry when we, you know, when we started the church. I didn't want to go live stream because I thought, well, maybe people just stay home, right? It kind of was kind of comfortable, right, during the, soul, the, during, during the lockdown to, you know, just listen, watch the church on, on YouTube because we couldn't meet or whatever. But no, we need to be zealous for the house of God. We need to have a passion, enthusiasm for this place. You know, I just want you to know as the pastor of this church, you know, I do have an enthusiasm for you, for the Lord, for this church. You know, I, I, I hope, my, my goal is to, to grow in that zeal, right? To, to place it in the right place and help you guys to make sure that you also have a zeal for the Lord. Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord,